Hello? Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, start. I know this is a little bit overkill for this smaller group that far, but it, it helps with the uh, podcast and the video recording to be on the microphone. <laughs> it's all about audio. Anyway, um, <clears throat> welcome to the Rocky Mountain Vendors Association. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, for the new people. We meet typically the second and fourth Mondays here, uh, 7 to 9, and then we have some uh, joint association meetings with the Denver Public Library on search instruction, and the Denver Patent Office uh, comes about once a quarter to talk about general intellectual property, and they, they run some of their own classes too, usually during uh, weekday business hours, but um, you can get announcements on what they've got going on too, and all these things are... Uh, well, those are, are no charge at the library and the, and the patent office. So that can be helpful, too. Um, so what we have coming up uh, next month, uh, the uh, second Monday in August, we have uh, Bonnie Kack coming. She's a marketing trade show person. So she's going to talk about uh, going to uh, trade shows for your particular product and how to set up, what to do, what not to do. Uh, this is one of the first steps a lot of inventors take, you know, once their product is protected, to show it off, meet players in the industry, all in one place, and get a feel for what their competitors are up to and stuff. Um, typically, industry-specific trade shows are going to be in another city, so it's going to be some expenditure of time, and if you get a booth, it's even more money. But a lot of people just go as an attendee, just look around and talk to people and uh, to make their, their contacts and do their networking. And then we've got a, uh, the fourth Monday in, in August, we've got a manufacturing expert, uh, James Holmes, I think his name. And uh, so he's got an engineering background and he's gonna talk about various manufacturing issues, which I'll have in more detail in the email. And so, on through the year, we've got some things scheduled with the uh, Jobs Act, Securities Exchange Commission, and um, I have a, I'm going to give a talk on franchise agreements and licensing agreements, which uh, people usually can have some questions on. So anyway, uh, we'll do a little uh, round robin here. Everyone introduce yourself and talk about what you got going on. Uh, uh, if you have an idea and you don't have it protected and you haven't already publicly disclosed it, you should still keep it confidential. Uh, so you can talk about things generically, like the function it does, just not the detail of how it gets there, <laughs> if you want to still keep it confidential. Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Roberto Ruscana. I'm a patent agent. I've been registered with the USPTO. I've been uh, practicing patent law for 15 years now. I am the U.S. correspondent of a few Italian law firms, so I do the filing and prosecution of uh, patent application in the U.S. that already been uh, filed uh, in, uh, in Europe or just in Italy.
Okay, so the speaker tonight is Scott Densmore. He's a, a client of mine, and uh, he works for a company called FDB Limited, right? And they, they're called an M&A advisory for mergers and acquisitions. So Scott's going to talk about business valuation. Now, for a lot of inventors, this is a subject kind of down the road, but it's important to know things up front because the whole purpose of this process, getting your intellectual property, getting your product in the market, is you're creating something of value. And eventually you'll sell it. So you're going to sell everything you have someday <laughs> for one reason or another. So to have an idea what adds value and what doesn't is important all the long process because that is the bottom line. And it's like, like you got a patent, patent isn't worth that much until it's associated with a commercially successful product. And then it's value goes up quite a bit. Anyway, I will turn it over to Scott. Thank you. Is this working good? said, uh, I'm a client of his, um, I was working on a patent with Roger. No one else hears that? No one else hears the vibrating? Okay. Just, it's perfect? Okay. All right. I'll try to ignore it. <clears throat> um, and I do work for the FBB group. It's a, uh, like you said, mergers and acquisitions advisory firm. Some people call us uh, business brokers on the lower end. On the upper end, it's uh, investment bankers. We kind of fall in the middle category, um, uh, business intermediary. So today, I'm just going to give you an overview of, of the market. Uh, we're going to look at some valuation methods, and then if we have time, we can get on to a case study. Um, so the market that I tend to work in is Main Street and the lower middle market. When we talk about Main Street market, uh, these are valuations. This is transaction size. So um, you can see less than 500,000, 500 to a million, uh, a million to two. These are just kind of general, um, general terms. You know, lower middle market is pretty huge. You can see it goes from 2 million to 50 million in transaction value. So there's a wide range of, uh, of businesses that fall, fall into that market. Just looking at, I don't know, um, just looking at some of the active buyers in these markets. So when we're looking at the market, who's buying these companies uh, can, can help you. Uh, at the Main Street level, you're looking at a lot of individual buyers, uh, some existing companies. But for the most part, it's individual buyers. As you move into the lower middle market, uh, then that's where the private equity groups start start coming in, the 18% range. Um, and existing companies are acquiring, and the, the individuals are still there, but they, they're a much smaller uh, segment of your buyers. The industries in, that are popular in Main Street that you'll see, so the personal services, the restaurants, um, and, uh, and you know, consumer goods, those kind of businesses are what you're going to see in that Main Street marketplace. Uh, as you move into lower middle market, things like manufacturing, uh, construction, and uh, business services kind of start to take over. So I think for our purposes, most people here are probably looking at manufacturing or you know, wholesale distribution type companies. If you have a product and you're trying to get it on the market, so it's a, a good you know good thing to think about is you want to, you're trying to become a larger business. You don't want to get stuck down in Main Street because you're going to be you're going to be looking for a much larger company. So talking about selling businesses. How many of them actually sell? So they, th to read this here, it says, Exit Planning Institute estimates that some four and a half million firms representing more than $10 trillion in business value will 
transition over the next decade or so. But only about 20 to 30 percent of those businesses that go to market end up selling. And those numbers are verified by uh, the largest website right now is bizbysell.com. They report near 10,000 transactions last year, um, and those are the quarterly transaction numbers. And they, they have a lot of data uh, that they're tracking, and they, they'll tell you that one in five businesses will ever sell. It's one in five businesses that go to market that someone's trying to sell that, that will ever, ever sell. Um, so me as a business intermediary, we have a lot higher close rate one in five, but we all, we turn away more businesses than we accept. So when people come to us and they're looking to sell their company, we do some vetting, and uh, most of the time we determine that they're, they're really not sellable. So we go to get. It's just for bizbysell.com. So, Types of transactions? Yeah. Right. I guess you could look at it like that. We don't really tend to break those out, but for sure, there's some buyers are strategic. Right. Um, so there are different buyers and there's different uh, desires of those buyers and uh, obviously best case scenario is to try to find someone that's not looking at the financial, that, that wants a strategic acquisition and they're willing to pay more, for sure. Uh, so this is uh, talking about the, the sale price versus the asking price and uh, for the most part there's not a whole lot of negotiation that we've found. There's not a lot of wiggle room in those in those prices. They're very close nationwide. Uh, quarter one, 2018, they got 92% of the ask. And uh, this this data is from um, this one's the IBBA, International Business Brokers Association, their quarterly reports. Um, and this one. Breaks it out into different market segments. Um, and you can see that for the, for the most part, those prices stay right there to ask. But these are for the, the transactions that actually close, right? So I think a big part of transactions that don't close is when owners uh, have unrealistic expectations of value and when they just they won't ever get it. That's what the data is showing. So looking at the market, this one is talking about uh, proactive exit planning. And you can see that as the value of the transaction goes up, the percentage of business owners that actively plan their exit also goes up. So is this a uh, because the, the owners are more savvy? It's possible. Um, or if there's more businesses in the lower, lower end of the markets, that's possible also. Um, but it's really important. It's really important to plan for your exit. And in a good business, when you start, you're looking at exit plans from the beginning uh, because you don't really want to get to. A lot of the reason why some of these businesses don't sell is because the owner has a uh, medical event and has to sell, or or there's burnout. And burnout sometimes worse than a medical event because you're just done. <laughs> An exit plan, so there's a few different ways to exit your business. You're either going to leave it to somebody, you're going to sell it to a third party, you can sell it to your employees, uh, but at some point, you're going to leave your business. Um, and so to have a plan on how you exit your business is, is very wise. And for most people, hopefully it would be, the uh, you know, if you don't want to leave it to a family member, then you would sell it, you would get some of that value. Unfortunately, a lot of the business owners that don't plan for an exit strategy end 
up just closing the doors and selling off the assets. It happens quite often. But, right, and if you don't plan for it, it just, right, comes up. So all these numbers are, are uh, transaction value. So this one is uh, less than 500,000 in transaction value. So sale price is the business. So the sale of your business is a process, not an event. And um, I won't bore you with reading all that, but and honestly, it's not such a linear process. It's more of a business maze. There's a whole lot that goes on um, with exit planning, even in something that sounds as simple as selling to a third party. There, there's just a, there's a lot involved. Um, so that was just to give you a little overview of the market, and we'll try to jump into some of the meat of why we're here, right? What's my business worth? How do I value a business? So value can be found in many different ways. There's uh, there's somewhere around 30-ish different methods on valuing the business, um, and they will come up with different numbers, every single one of them. And they're often used for very different reasons, and um, there, there's just there's a multitude of reasons why you want a, a business value. Are you changing from a C-Corp to an S-Corp? Uh, or is, is there a divorce? Are you buying out a partner? Um, there, there's a lot of different reasons. but. The, uh, the, main, the main reasons or the main approaches are the income approach, the market approach, and the asset approach. Uh, the income approach, the main principle is that economic value reflects anticipated future benefits. And so they're saying, what would I pay to get the same level of earnings in a similar investment? And this is really looking at small company stocks. And when we say small company, they're, they're usually you know, $50 million, $500 million companies in, in transaction value. They, I mean, it gets, it gets huge very fast. And so small company stocks, publicly traded companies, it's not, this is a good valuation method for those when you're comparing what stocks to buy, but it's not really a good valuation method for small businesses. Uh, the asset approach talks about a buyer will pay no more than that which he or she would have to pay to purchase equally desirable subsidies. So these are kind of like restaurants. They're very asset heavy. Um, they tend to go under all the time. And when you're selling them, you're really selling your assets. And then the market approach. The market approach has the same as the income approach, uh, the principal. The buyer will, will pay no more than, uh, um, I think I messed that up, but the same, same as the asset approach that um, you're looking, you're not going to pay more than, than what you'd have to pay to purchase an equally desirable substitute. But this one really is the best when using, when valuing a small business in the main street and the lower middle markets, um, depending on the availability of market data. So when we look at valuing a business, there's really three main things that we look at. And I'll just kind of read this to you real quick. There is no simple method, and there are numerous formulas for valuing a business. Our experience has shown that there are three key components that are used in computing value, valuation models. One is the earning power, two is the specific assets being sold, and three is the marketplace demand. Um, earning power, and I, I'll dive into this if we have questions on this, but earning power is a function of annual earnings for larger businesses, particularly those with audited financial statements, an EBITDA calculation is used. So we're talking EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, for smaller businesses, the calculation is adjusted to SDE, or seller's discretionary earnings, by adding back the expenses attributable to private ownership and accounting for the salary of one owner. So is everyone following? that, or should I jump into that a little bit deeper? We're good? Yeah. 
Try to say it again. Yes. Yeah, we look at it, we look at all this. So we use the direct market data method, which takes all three of these into consideration. Um, sometimes people get stuck on the differences between EBITDA and SDE. It's just a different, you, you hear about business valuations as multiples of cash flow, right? And that can be kind of dangerous just to throw that out without explaining EBITDA and SBE because if you're talking about a three times multiple, are you talking three times what? Three times SBE, that can be very different. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so I'm trying to, to start establishing what are what is earning power. Um, the appraised or fair market value of the assets being transferred, as well as other value drivers unique to this specific business, is also considered. These factors are overlaid on industry and transactional market data to come up with an appropriate capitalization rate, which is then applied to calculate a range of values. So when we're looking, talking about earning power again, when we're looking at different transaction sizes, most of these in the small business, in, in the main street, and beginning in the New Orleans market, will run off the SBE calculation. And the main reason why they do this is because most of those businesses are owner operated. So the owner is working in the business and pulling a salary. And when you calculate those SBE numbers, taking into account all of the earnings that the owner is making, so all so seller's discretionary earnings. When you jump up into the larger businesses, they move to an EBITDA calculation, which includes the, the, the owner's salary is considered an expense, and so the EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, does not include the owner's salary a lot of times you could have absentee owners here, or if you're selling to private equity or if you're getting it acquired, um, the owner is not going to be there. They're looking at replacing that, that owner with an employee, if that makes sense. Right. So let's say you have a small business and, the, and it's owner operated um, and the owner's bringing in 400000 a year. If you could replace him for $100,000 a year in your EBITDA. Right, so the EBITDA would be 300000 I mean, this is very, very basic. I'm, you know, I'm not, it's not that technical, but. <laughs> so just looking at some market data, um, this is uh, year in 2017, um, and these are the median multiples paid for small businesses um, nationwide. So when you're looking at um, you know, quarter four 2017, we're seeing 2, 2.5, 3.1, when you jump to the EBITDA multiple, looking at four and five. Now, part of the reason why there's a jump is because that even number is smaller. But another part of the reason of the jump is that higher uh, cash flows are more desirable. It's, it's easier to sell a business uh, that, that has a million dollars plus cash flow than it is to sell a business that makes a hundred thousand. For sure, and, and and investors are looking for that. So the, the big three, the big three things that uh, buyers are looking for is they want to they want to pay themselves a livable wage. Um, they want to be able to service their debt, and they want a, a cash on cash ROI for their investment. Um, Excuse me? 
I mean, definitely a buyer is, is buying because he thinks they can, he can increase the value of the business, right? Um, and, and so they, they definitely look for that kind of stuff. But when you're valuing a company, you really can't get paid on the potential. They, they get paid on, on the history. What has that company, how, how much money has it been making in the past? Which is why uh, Roger kind of brought up that patent by itself is really hard to sell. Um, it, you know, our firm, the FDB group, that wouldn't know what to do with a patent <laughs> by itself. You know, there's, there's really, we don't know buyers for that. Uh, the buyers that we're dealing with are looking for cash flow. Um, and so, right. So we sold a company recently, uh, it was in the newspaper, usually business transactions are confidential, but this one was in the newspaper, uh, they were in Monument, um, HD, Max HD sunglasses. They had a few patents on, um, on their sunglasses and they still went out of business, they went bankrupt. And I guess they didn't go totally out of business. But we sold them in bankruptcy to an acquirer uh, who picked up the patents, but picked up the manufacturing. They got a good deal on that. Right, the business wasn't being run. So basically they thought that they could run the business better than the previous owners could. They saw something of value there. Yeah, for sure. So, I see, I see where you're headed, but but they were picking it up for what Roger was saying. They um, they were getting a steal. That's probably a bad example for me to bring up. They were get, they were paying off debt, pennies on the dollar, and they were able to pick up a manufacturing company for very cheap that has patents. So at that point, they were looking at it more of a strategic acquisition than a financial acquisition. Yeah. I mean, you're buying the, you would buy that business based off cash flow. So it's not always three, but So pitching to Shark Tank, now I'm not a venture capital expert at all, but venture capital breaks the rules. They, uh, they do things that don't make sense to me. Look at Tesla. They've been losing money forever, and they're worth... And it's very speculative, and those guys are looking for 10x returns. They're not looking for a couple times profit. I mean, they, they're gambling big time, they're betting big dollars. That's that's a game that I'm not familiar with. But it doesn't it doesn't really go with that's not really the same game <laughs> as its value is in the cash flow.
and most of the time the assets, unless it's an asset valuation or a very asset heavy company, most of the time the assets are only in place to make the cash flow. No one wants to buy used equipment. They're buying cash flow. So like we, we have a we have a company for sale right now. Um, I'm just kind of going off the top of my head on the numbers, but it's for sale for about 1.5 million dollars. They have 1.3 million in assets. That's completely ignored in the valuation. Um, it's valued at 1.5 because it's a multiple of they make 475 thousand dollars cash flow a year. So they're getting about a three times multiple on their cash flow. Now they're selling the assets. It's an asset sale. But in the valuation of that business, those assets are only in place to make money. No one's buying, no one wants to buy the assets. They're buying the cash flow. So, for example, Right, so the median multiple that was paid for small businesses in the under $500,000 transaction quarter four, 2017 was a two multiple. So let's say you're right at 500,000 for transaction thing, and that's telling you that they were cash flow in 250,000. Yeah, they're seller's discretionary earnings. What the owner is bringing home is 250,000. And that business is worth half a So, we also run what we call a buyer sanity test, and this will kind of help you think about this. Numbers. Can you guys even read the numbers? I'm, I might have to talk through it. So we're looking at the three things, right? Paying yourself a livable wage, being able to service your debt, and giving yourself a cash on cash ROI. So let's say this company transaction value is $400,000. The seller's discretionary earnings, the cash flow is $100,000. So we're looking at a four multiple of SDE here. Um, to pay yourself a, a, a livable wage, $50,000. Nowadays, I think the median cost for a household is above that. Um, so $50,000 is fairly considered a livable wage. And then, um, so if you pay yourself your livable wage, $50,000, Service your debt, and so your your loan. We're assuming a 3.5% um, closing cost, 20% down payment, 10 years at 6%. Now our our interest rates are rising. We're seeing 6.75 is what we use in our in our calculations now. Uh, SBA loan. This is to reflect the current SBA loan market. So 10 years at 6% in this one. Um, leaves you with a 3% rate of return and a debt service coverage ratio of 1.1, which is unlendable. No bank will loan on this. Um, in order to, to service your debt, you have to have at least a 1.2 uh, debt service coverage ratio, and they'd like to see 1.5. Right, so we're, we've got total investment cost of this is 444000 when you add in all your closing costs. Your down payment, it's like you're putting down about almost $90,000. Um, and so your debt is 355000 at these terms. Your annual debt service is $47,000. So it leaves you with the cash on cash return of 2000 your, your, your cash return is 2600 is a 3% of your investment of 88000 um, So this one does not pass the buyer sanity test. No buyer would want, want to do that. Right. So we look at something a little bit different. Let's say the purchase price is 450000 now. Um, and your cash flow is 150000 
that enables you to pay yourself $75,000 a year. So now we're talking livable wage. You can service your debt. And what you're left with is a debt service coverage ratio of 1.4 and a 19 and a half percent return cash on cash ROI. Now we're talking that's lendable and, and that's doable. So most buyers are looking for a, uh, a, a minimum of 20% ROI. And in service industries, 30%. Because you're, it, it's a measure of risk, right? So the, the more risky an investment, the higher the rate of return that you want to get. And a small business, and buy, buying single company stocks is a high risk investment. Buying a small business is, So here's a case study. Um, one of the businesses that we sold earlier this year, uh, $745,000 was the list price. It was marketed for under two months, and, um, and it, it closed in 128 days uh, for, for higher than the asking price. This was a very interesting, um, it was just a, an interesting setup. It was a very savvy buyer. And this was a property management company. And what he did was he, he assigned a value to every account that they had and, and wrote it into the contract that you know, they're giving them uh, incentives to do better, to increase business, right? So if you can get more accounts, right? He was buying those accounts, the cash flow from those accounts. If you get more accounts, I'll give you more money. If you lose accounts, you get less money. So they closed at 788, but they had, um, I think, six months after closing to settle the account. So if they lost accounts after after changing ownership, then the sale price went down. It was interesting. Right, but they still left. Uh, I think there was, I think there was $75,000 in escrow. Um, so they could adjust that price based off of the account retention. But this is their uh, this was their cash flow. Um, so when we take when we look at financials, we recast the financial statements. Small businesses tend to show as little profit as possible where large businesses tend to show as much profit as possible uh, to keep their shareholders happy. Right. So if you look at this company, the income on their tax return is a lot different from their cash flow. So we add back owner salaries. This one had, this one had some, some interesting things going on. They had uh, they had two owners, and the owners had purchased the business from parents of one of the owners, and kept them on and paid them an excessive salary. Um, so those salaries were added back to the calculation. Right. So a lot of times with small businesses, there's excessively paid employees, there's underpaid employees, there's sometimes there's family members working in the business that don't pull a paycheck, and you you have to readjust for that. Right. Right. So. So here's the ROI on, on that business. 788,000 was the sale price. 20% uh, down. Their discretionary earnings were $204,000. That was uh, average over the last three years. So you can pay yourself $75,000. You can service your debt. And they have a 1.5 debt service coverage ratio with almost 26% ROI. Cash on cash. Pretty good. 
So, so the third factor is marketplace demand. And marketplace demand kind of goes into those value drivers that you hear people talking about. Um, and they basically come down to two things. One is reducing risk, uh, and then the other is increasing benefits, if that makes sense. Um, factors that can make a, a business more valuable can be as simple as uh, what kind of licensing do you need to run your company? So like an electrical company, a master electrician has to buy it. You're reducing your buyer pool. So if you can make the business to where more buyers are able to buy it, say your employees are a master electrician. Right. You're not dependent upon your employees. Uh, glamorous businesses that white collar, you know, big dollar businesses, those are more attractive. Um, and it just it all comes down to these, uh, the different things that are specific to the business. So if you think about it as like gas stations, right? So you have three gas stations. They're on the, they could be on the same intersection, one on each corner of the intersection, and let's say that they um, they all have car washes, they have a store, they have gas pumps, they all gross $5 million, and they all have a revenue cash flow of 100000 Right? Gas stations are very low profit margins. Um, if you take a look at the first gas station, one it's a little bit older, has a less desirable gas brand, the, the revenue trend is down. Um, their machinery is constantly being repaired. And you look at the second gas station, it's not too old, but it's not new. The, uh, they have a solid customer base and good gas and decent car wash and steady numbers. When you look at the third gas station, it's brand new, modern. The revenue is trending up. They're stealing market share from the old gas station. Um, and their fancy car wash can wash your car three times faster than anyone else on the same intersection. So you can kind of start to see that just cash flow, it gives you a starting point, and it definitely, it's what you're going to multiply, right? Right. So that gives you what you're going to multiply, but to find the right multiplier, really depends off of those value drivers. Um, I had a, so value drivers, there's massive amount of value drivers that you can uh, that you can look at. I've started, I haven't finished putting together a list, but I've got a few of them. And uh, so let's talk about financial performance. Top line revenue. Are you growing faster or slower than your competition? Bottom line profit, are you tracking your margins? Um, are your numbers defensible? And have you invested in an audit? So I, I had some handouts back there. I'm not sure if y'all got one. But it's uh, positioning your business for sale. And it talks about um, things that you can do to, to increase the value of your business. Um, our founder always says, good numbers sell businesses faster for more money. The, the number one reason that deals fall through is shoddy financials. The, the, a lot of small business owners aren't really good at tracking numbers and, and keeping their books clean. Uh, clean books, I mean, you will pay taxes now, but clean books in the long run is very beneficial. Uh, besides, it's you know just being honest, right? <laughs> um, So other things they look at, growth potential. And, and so they want to see the growth potential, but they don't want to pay you for it. <laughs> but they want it to be there. So what's the market size? Is the industry growing? Is there heavy regulation? Is it cyclical in nature? Um, what's the future potential of, of the business? Um, is it scalable? Can you cross-sale other products to your customer base? Uh, are you up to date with technology? What's your customer concentration look like? That's a big one. So I looked at a uh, steel fabrication company 
they were doing good, they had good numbers, and they had one customer that was 80% of their sales. The only person you could ever sell that to is their customer. <laughs> right. If you lose that account, your business is done. It's just too risky. So you don't want you don't want customer concentration to be greater than ten percent. You don't want one customer to be more than ten percent. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that would be the, more of the strategic acquirer. So we recently sold a um, company that was building supplier. They, they had a couple million in sales, but they were not profitable. Um, but they had, they had a big warehouse with a lot of employees and, um, and a lot of customers, and they had a couple million in sales. Um, and so a strategic acquirer came in and bought them, bought the company just because they were buying market share. They felt like they could run it a little bit better and, and turn it into a profitable you know, outlet. What's that? Right, yeah, they were they were already established and they were just buying into this market. This was a new market for them. They were out of state. Um, so along with customer concentration, Money really wasn't a factor in that one. There was really nothing to multiply. They were just, they did asset value. Right. They were buying the location, the warehouse, the workers. You can get industry benchmarks. I mean, the accuracy of the data is always in question, right? I mean, who really? You know, sometimes these surveys go around and ask business owners what they make, but what are they telling? You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. there's there's databases. They try the best that they can, um, but Hoover's is a big uh, database that that a lot of people use for statistics for looking up business. Sometimes I, I've um, I've seen a business on Hoover's where it said they're doing a hundred or they're doing one million in sales, um, and you talk to the owner and they're doing a hundred thousand in sales. Um, but then I also saw a business on Hoover's said they were doing two million in sales, and I talked to the owner and they're doing four million. But with accuracy like that, you know, it kind of. Sure. <laughs> um, customer concentration, employee dependence. Are you relying on your key employees? Uh, do you have mid-level managers? Do you have a management succession plan? Um, so there's a company for sale. I saw it on BizBuySell, BizBuySell.com. It's a uh, metal manufacturing uh, business, and the owner has been absent. His manager wants to retire, so he's selling the business. He's very dependent on that key employee. I mean, luckily, the guy notified him, right? But if he would have just quit, what happens to your business? If your cash flow tanks, everything that you built you know, is tanked. So you got to watch the employee dependence. Uh, same with supplier diversification. So there's just a, there's a never-ending list, honestly, of, of, of value drivers. Uh, there are a few outlined on this handout that are good, um, but there's tons of stuff online. Biz by Sell has some free eBooks. Um, IBBA.org has a lot of industry research and information on there. There's definitely.
I feel like I gave you a decent overview. Is there something I missed? Any questions? I'm sorry, say that again. Off the top of my head, no, I don't. You know, that's more of the, I think that's more of the venture capital kind of stuff. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're small, you can't Right. Right, the larger, you know, money guys that we we deal with are search funds, private equity groups, and they're looking for companies uh, that are they're looking for the cash flow. So a lot of times they don't even like um, they don't like real estate because they want the highest ROI possible. They, Like we have a business for sale right now, they're cash flowing around nine hundred thousand a year, um, and which would be great right, if they didn't have seven million dollars of real estate. So when you have seven million dollars of real estate, they just like buying land. They just like buying land. They, since we've had them listed, they keep buying. They keep buying. This is not, I mean, that's obviously an extreme case, but a lot of business owners do, you know, they'll, they'll start a business, they have a little bit of extra money, they buy the real estate that they're in, uh, then they start, you know, maybe they'll buy the, right, or maybe they'll buy the whole building and rent to a tenant downstairs, and they just start collecting these assets, and it's actually bogging them down. So, when, when it comes to, for sure. When it comes to selling a business, they really want the cash flow, not the asset. A lot of times you do. But if you're trying to exit your company, you really want to be a landlord now. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's just a lot of consideration.
So this by sell is, is kind of closest. There's, there's about eight different websites that we advertise on, but we do mostly seller representation. So we're looking for the clients that aren't listed. We're trying to bring them to market. You're finding the buyers. We're finding the sellers. The buyers come to us. Oh. If, you have the, if you have a good business, yeah, seller side representation. Um, there's so many businesses. Most of them just come to us. Uh, we, we have, um, obviously, advertising you know, through uh, the internet, social media, uh, direct mail, just different ways. Uh, but the firm that I work for is very established in Colorado Springs. They're not real popular up here in Denver. But in Colorado Springs, they're very well known. They've been there since 1982, sold over 1,000 businesses in Colorado. Um, the referrals just come in on a, on a daily basis, honestly. We do mostly turn your businesses away. Business intermediary? Um, I guess if you wanted to compare, I mean, I, I, you know, it's not my favorite thing, but it's almost like a real estate agent. We have real estate licenses, so, but for business. But there's, see, business brokerage is different because we, most of what we do is very confidential. Business owners aren't going to stick a for sale sign in their window. So we have to market a business confidentially. Um, so. Right, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't even know they existed. How many brokers are at our office? I think we have five or six. Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk to people and, and uh, we try to help out everybody as much as we can. And we can. I'm sorry, say that again. Right. A, a, an entrepreneur should start an exit strategy from the beginning. So, like, there was a guy I heard about, um, I think he had donut shop. This was a while ago. One of, one of my mentors, mentors. Yeah. And, um, and so he had donut shop. So when he went and bought his donut shop, he made sure that they met all the qualifications of a 7 -Eleven. So that was his exit strategy. If it didn't work out, he was going to sell it to 7-Eleven. He had the right number of parking spaces, he had the right traffic count, he had the right square footage, he had the right layout. So like back in the day, um, my dad did commercial real estate for Bell South, and they had uh, Southern Bell, a big phone company in the South. Here. They, um, they had call centers, data centers, and all the data centers had these giant parking lots in the back building but when the data centers were when they were done when they were moving out of that facility there's nothing they could do with it so they started building them like strip malls and so when you build a data center you put all your parking in the front you know that way when you're done with it you sell it to somebody that you use for retail uh -oh. but you should always be yeah looking at your exit uh, from the beginning uh, good books honestly good accounting is, is really the got to be up to date on your, you know, your account. And it's always good to have uh, someone else doing the book because that's the number one reason that deals fall through is bad books. So, uh, 
we'll be able to. Yeah, well, I had a lady last week tell me that. She said, look, there's books and there's books. And I said, really? So she was, she was telling me that her point of sale system was not going to match her taxes. Um, and that she had two sets of books. And I was talking about, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. No, we will not engage with, I mean, if there's active fraud, you know, we're not going to engage with that. We, you get a reputation for what kind of businesses that you are dealing with. And buyers um, won't, want to, won't want to deal with you. That's when they'll start calling you a real estate agent use car sales. <laughs> you know. No, it's all good. It's all good. In Colorado, there's 18 states uh, that make you have a real estate license to do business brokerage, and Colorado's one of them. So we're Uh, no, I, I have I do not have a degree in finance. Um, I did go to business school, so I have uh, I have an associate's in fire science. I've got a bachelor's in homeland security, uh, master's in biblical studies, and then I went to business school. Yeah. But I've always been interested in business. I had a couple of small businesses myself. Um, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> on, on the patent? Yeah, I just want to license that. Yes, I'm open to selling it outright. I'm open to licensing it. Um, nothing right now. I guess that depends which lawyer you're going to do, right? <laughs> Where are those? Do you have those? I'd love to see that. The only thing I found, I was doing some research. I came up with it, but somewhere around three to five percent. But yeah, that's like you do a little bit of right. 
Cool. Right. So retail sales is a multiple of manufacturing costs, right? I just had this thought pop in my head. Uh, Rocky Mountain Adventure Club, I think, might interest you. I think that's what they're called. Uh, For venture capital. Take massive percentages. take like a giant chunk of the ownership. Don't they usually take a giant chunk of their ownership in the company? Yeah.
great difficulty. 